Chapter 2 A Night at the Museum The Doctor and Romana exited the TARDIS and stood on the shattered pavement, staring at the grandeur of the Albion Imperial Museum. As far as they could tell, virtually all the day's visitors had left by now, but the small gate between the sentry box and the grand but bolted double gates remained open. Slightly more problematic, the sentry box remained occupied. The air between Romana and the Doctor had not warmed in the last five minutes. The Doctor wondered if it ever would, particularly as Romana's cold eyes turned to regard him. And how do you suggest we approach this? She asked with cool efficiency. The Doctor would not, or could not, allow the prevailing weather to dampen his spirits. His response was once more brisk and decisive. Well, I have always favoured the direct approach. Romana's expression betrayed very little but made clear she was awaiting more details. She nodded once, curtly, and gestured with her left hand for him to lead on. The doctor bowed his head graciously, then obliged. Together, the two Time Lords approached the guard in his shelter. As they did so, he took a step outside and partially blocked their path to the gate. Sir, madam, may I help you? He asked politely but officiously. Standing now in front of their first close-up Albion, Romana could finally discern some of their non-human characteristics. His outfit was all too earthly. A military, or faux military, uniform of navy blue dress trousers and buttoned-up jacket over a light yellow shirt and black tie. The ensemble was finished with a flat-topped peaked hat, also navy blue. His hands bore black leather gloves, but where the skin was exposed the first, oddities began to shine through. His complexion was a startling white not the pinky, bluey beige, or tan shared by some Gallifreyans or humans. Never was there a more inappropriately named pigmentation. No, this was a truly blindingly alabaster hue. It shone even more starkly against the dark colors of his uniform and what little could be seen of his almost black-brown hair escaping from beneath the cap. This was by no means the end of his, by Gallifreyan or earthly standards, unusual features. The Albion nose was so small and subtle it threatened to disappear entirely and could only be easily discovered via the modest overhang offering scant shade to two pinpricks of nostrils. By contrast, the lips beneath these tiny holes were remarkably full, while the width of the mouth conformed more closely to expectations. The eyes, however, were a completely different matter. They began slightly above that tiny nose and were as wide if not wider than the mouth and probably as full. Each one made it close to the temple, left and right, but due to their vast size there was barely half their width between them. They also made impressive inroads into the territory traditionally governed by the forehead, the tops of the guard's eyes barely visible beneath the peak of his cap. While Romana was making a detailed and engrossed inspection of the Albion's features, the doctor used this opportunity to answer his question. He reached into an inside pocket and produced a blank card in a slim leather wallet. We are on urgent museum business, he pronounced gravely. Although this seemed physically impossible, the guard's eyes widened in astonishment. The Xeron delegation? That explains your odd appearance. Surprise had robbed him of tact, and he quickly realized his mistake. Er, uh, I mean, unusual appearance by Albion standards. My apologies, sir, madam. You must be here for Sir Arthur Buchan's dinner. It's in the West Wing in Sir Arthur's entertaining room. Just head to the main West Wing entrance. It's on the end nearest the road. The guard was obviously flustered and made all the more eager to please through his embarrassment. As he explained, he gesticulated wildly towards their goal. Think nothing of it, my good man, the doctor said with unusual smoothness, even smiling politely. He then turned to his companion. So, Romana, are you ready to dine? Always, Romana responded 
gracing the doctor with a painfully polite smile of her own. The doctor shuddered briefly before nodding his thanks to the guard and leading the way into the courtyard. They walked with an unhurried gait in the general direction of the side of the west wing indicated by the sentry. Eventually, curiosity got the better of Romana's stony silence. So that was an Albion? she asked. The doctor nodded. Tell me, are they also pallid? Romana pressed. The doctor inclined his head with a slight smile. Indeed, he replied. That china-white complexion is shared with all their species, right back to their most ancient Chiroan forebears. It's an evolutionary adaptation, helps reflect much of the more intense EM radiation from their B-type star. Romana raised an eyebrow. Should I go back to the TARDIS and apply some zinc cream? She inquired with moderate weary concern. The doctor shook his head vigorously. Of course not. We are time lords, remember? We are more than robust enough for these conditions. Romana contemplated this for a second. Then another thought struck her. I suppose once viewed up close, they do differ somewhat from a Gallifreyan, or human physique. Those huge eyes and tiny nose for starters. I take it they are typical. The doctor's eyes rolled skywards as he thought for a moment. Yes, they do have a somewhat Bratsy appearance, he mused. Romana frowned. Bratsian? I don't think I'm familiar with that race. The doctor looked alternately flustered and embarrassed. Yes, well, utterly unimportant. We are certainly not going to encounter those, them in our current locale, he said hurriedly. Romana narrowed her eyes at the doctor's discomfort but could not for now discern its exact cause. She continued her assessment of the native inhabitants. Facial features aside, they do possess quite an abundance of humanoid characteristics, their clothes, their hair. With these last two words, the doctor held up a finger to interrupt. Not hair, my dear Romana. The Albions have large leaf-like membranes which spring from a central line along the top of their scalp, then fold down either side of their heads. The Chiroans, even to this day, keep these fronds covered beneath headscarves and the like. Quite unearthly, really. Romana looked unconvinced, her eyes once more narrowing at the doctor. Granted his cap was covering much of his head, but I swear I saw some hair-like curls. Once more the doctor looked thrown off his stride. Uh, so, in the outer planets at least, the prevailing fashion has become to cut their fronds into fine strips, in many cases spending several hours in salons to get these strips as narrow as possible. Um, I suppose you might say almost hair-like. Romana nodded slowly. No doubt inspired by images seen in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm so glad the cultural contamination has been so... limited, she said with heavy sarcasm. The doctor was saved from the immediate need to respond by their arrival at the modest door to the West Wing. He rapped upon it with his best impression of decisiveness and gusto. The door was opened by yet another pale Albion this time dressed in attire that would have befitted an earthly manservant or butler of the early part of the twentieth century. He wore a long black jacket with matching trousers and waistcoat, while his neck was somewhat constricted by a high and stiffly starched shirt collar. May I help you, sir, madam? he asked with slow, deliberate politeness, tinged by condescension. The doctor held up the psychic paper. We are here for the dinner, he said simply but firmly. A delegation from the Ministry of Antiquities, the butler said with mild surprise. He then continued, Please, follow me. Together, Romana and the doctor followed him through the door into the corridor beyond. The servant then moved to a door on the right side of this passage and knocked. Yes? came a muffled voice from within. The butler opened the door and walked through, the doctor and Romana hot on his heels. They entered a moderately sized dining room, or at least a room devoted to that purpose for this evening's event. The long table taking up much of the floor space could comfortably sit ten people, although it was not at this time fully occupied. The head of the table was furthest from the door and to the left of where the Time Lords were standing. The butler gave a short bow to the man seated there, presumably the aforementioned Sir Arthur Buchan. He was dressed in formal evening wear, his jacket removed and placed over the back of his chair, revealing a ruffled white shirt and bow tie, slightly loosened and askew. To their surprise, he did not rise to greet them. Behind his chair lay a sizable fireplace, unlit on this warm evening, 
against which lent a pair of crutches, the cause of his minor breach in etiquette becoming clearer. Sir Arthur, for we shall continue to assume it was he, looked a surprisingly young man and had the usual characteristics of an Albion, skin like bone china, a tiny nose above a fuller mouth, mid-brown hair forming a modest approximation to a short back and sides to partially frame his face. His enormous and startlingly green eyes held a haunted look, but were currently engaged in frowning at the two Time Lords with a mixture of puzzlement and mild irritation. This expression, minus the haunting, was shared by the handful of dinner guests also seated there, an oddly eclectic bunch they were to boot. On the left side of the top of the table, immediately to Sir Arthur's right, sat a woman who appeared completely inappropriately attired for the occasion. She wore a long, dark brown leather trench coat, concealing much of the rest of her outfit from her current position. What could clearly be seen, however, was a close-fitting leather flying helmet, complete with goggles perched upon her forehead. She appeared to be the very archetype of the flapper. Her eyes, which were of a hazel hue, shared the expression of the others, but seemed to be favouring the mild irritation side. Opposite her sat a man and a woman who, from the angle of the arms nearest each other, appeared to be holding hands under the table. It seemed obvious they were quite attached to one another, and not just via the fingers, most probably husband and wife. Both had jet black hair, his, as with Sir Arthur, medium length but giving the impression of being greased and combed back from the forehead to be closely and neatly adhered to his skull. Hers, by comparison, was a cute little bob, just reaching below the jawline. She wore a light, short-sleeved floral summer dress, and her outfit was finished off with quite a complex necklace of some brass-like metal, complete with a pendant of the same material inlaid with multicolored enamels, very much resembling the Art Deco style. The eyes of the couple, which like all the rest were turned upon Romana and the doctor, were of a very dark brown, the woman's perhaps just a shade lighter than the man's. Opposite this pair, and sitting next to the flapper, was one final gentleman, who, much like the aforementioned guest to his left, seemed to have missed the memo on proper evening attire. He wore a fairly crumpled brown fedora upon his head, set back upon it and slightly askew. Clearly neither he nor the flapper paid any heed to the no-hats-indoors rule. This slightly scruffy individual had failed to remove his outdoor coat as well, a grey trench coat with crumples to match his headgear. He also appeared to have something which looked suspiciously like a cigarette poking out of the corner of his mouth, although at the moment it appeared to have gone out. The doctor noted to himself that there was an ashtray among the place settings nearest to this most dishevelled of guests. Excuse me, my good man, lady, but this is a private dinner. Germaine, to whom am I speaking? Sir Arthur made this last remark towards his servant. Of course, sir, Germaine responded smoothly. Apparently they have been sent here by the Ministry of Antiquities. Before Sir Arthur could respond to this, the doctor flashed him his psychic paper and added, I'm sure your gate guard would tell you we are part of the Xeron delegation. Sir Arthur frowned and sighed impatiently. Percival's damned efficiency. He must have telecommed from Cairo and requested additional help be sent from the Ministry. Though why they thought it wise to send off world consultants, I've no idea. The doctor waggled his head non-committally. I'm sure what you say is perfectly plausible. Perhaps they feel whatever happened on Cairo might have unusual, even otherworldly origins. Sir Arthur harumphed, but seemed to accept this explanation, such as it was. I'm sorry, but I didn't seem to catch your names, he asked. I am the doctor, the doctor supplied helpfully. Their Albion host continued to frown. I'm sorry, but there are quite a few doctors of my acquaintance, even in this room. You may have to be more specific. The doctor held up a finger. Ah, but I am the definite article that makes it quite distinctive. Before Sir Arthur could respond, Romana cut in, betraying a little impatience. And I am Romanad Voratna Lunda, but you may call me Fred. As she said this, she narrowed her eyes a little in a subtle sidelong glance at the doctor. His eyes widened and darted about with a look of panic and confusion which seemed disproportionate to the impact of Romana's words. Nothing more was said on the subject, however, as Sir Arthur had made a decision. Well, you're here now, and we have both room and food to spare. So please, Doctor, Fred, take your seats and I shall introduce you to everyone. Then I shall illuminate all as to the real reason we are here. 
the doctor, attempting to regain both his composure and some measure of control over the situation, offered Romana the seat at the far end of the table, facing Sir Arthur, a place of honor. His attempt was foiled, however, by Romana spreading her hands wide and making a great pantomime of how she couldn't possibly, all the while never defrosting her eyes or smile. With a slight slump of his shoulders, the doctor accepted both the seat and defeat. Romana then took the seat to his right, on the same side of the table as the apparently happy couple. Sir Arthur nodded to himself once in satisfaction, as things returned to some semblance of order. Right, he said briskly. As promised, first. Introductions. Then I think, food. And once we are all in a well-nourished state of mind, the other business. This elicited a round of approving mumbles and bobbing heads from his guests. Seeing a consensus formed, Sir Arthur began the promised roll call. This is my friend and esteemed colleague here at the Albion Imperial Museum, Professor Louise Halbert, he said respectfully, gesturing to the leather-clad woman to his right. Her expression did not seem to conform to the neutral or pleased one such an introduction might be expected to provoke. Instead, she frowned and shifted in her seat with apparent irritation. Yes, Arthur. So esteemed it's a wonder I'm here at all rather than on Cairo. Or perhaps if we were even better friends I'd be there right now with all your old university chums. Sir Arthur frowned and sighed deeply, but seemed too distracted by other deeper, darker thoughts to respond immediately. Professor Halbert took this pause as an opportunity to address the doctor and Romana. And I prefer to go by Lou, she said gruffly, but in a tone which betrayed a fraction less ire than she had used with Sir Arthur. With laboured patience, their host now extended a hand towards the dishevelled man sitting next to Lou Halbert. And this is Nathan Ivan, a private investigator of unusual means and talents. He hails from that odd little island nation, somewhat to the west of the archipelago of Londra, Amarek. But don't hold that against him, he said with a friendly chuckle and a wink. But of course I have not simply invited him here tonight in some purely mercenary fashion, for his skills alone he continued in hurried explanation. Nathan is a great and true friend of mine, has been since we served together in the last great war. Romana's ears pricked up at this reference and she interrupted. The last great war? she asked curiously. Sir Arthur looked apologetic. Ah, yes, of course you may not be completely aware of all our recent history and political shenanigans. We have had more than a few great wars over the last century or so. Several planets seem to take umbrage at Albia's preeminent position as the bringer of peace, stability, and order to our system. Most recently it was Germany a tussling with us to be top dog, although most of the actual fighting took place above or on Gallia, for reasons I won't bore you with now. That was over eight years ago, but Nathan and I shared many experiences during the war. Saw dark horrors. With the last words, Sir Arthur's countenance clouded again and for a moment his thoughts were clearly elsewhere, haunted by the ghosts of yesterday. He visibly shook himself free of the mood. Anyway, Nathan may be counted on in a fix, and I trust him. I'm much obliged to you for your kind words, Sir Arthur, Nathan responded with a nod towards his friend. His voice had an oddly nasal drawl to it, almost as if someone with an RP English accent were trying to sound from somewhere in the United States on Earth but had only heard descriptions of the speech, never the sound. Nathan turned his attention to the doctor and Romana. Glad to make your acquaintances, Doctor. Fred. Any friend of Sir Arthur can depend. On what exactly the Time Lords could depend was never revealed, since with the word depend, the cigarette had fallen from Nathan's mouth and into his groin. Unaware that it had already gone out, there followed several frantic moments of patting, swatting and exploring until... With a relieved but sheepish grin, the singed tube was recovered. The detective shrugged awkwardly and placed it in the ashtray. Sir Arthur watched all this with a barely perceptible raise of his eyebrows, then moved on to his final guests. And last, but by no means least, allow me to introduce Timmy and Penny Cowley, the happy couple. Timmy and I ran into each other during that same unfortunate conflict wherein I met Nathan, and as with Nathan, Timmy and I looked out for one another. If we had not, I suspect none of us would be here to enjoy such a lovely dinner. Timmy brought the delightful penny into our lives some years after that particular great war, and they recently celebrated their first wedding anniversary. Here Sir Arthur paused and nodded approvingly to Penny and Timmy, 
who responded with broad smiles. Timmy owns a substantial and rapidly growing private security firm. He is by no means a sedentary employer either, and is always keen to offer hands-on experience, gleaned in part through combat, to the day-to-day -day running of his business. Penny is fast attaining quite some reputation herself as a formidable psychic. At this last statement, Romana frowned and leant towards the doctor. Her anger and disappointment towards him had in no way lessened, but she was mature, professional, and had no one else with which to make discreet inquiries. A psychic, she hissed softly behind her hand. The doctor feigned the need to cough and used this to cover his own whispered reply. Yes, it is a calling which is still held in unusually high regard for a developed society. Romana remained close to the doctor. Given what the TARDIS revealed of the state of this system, there may be good reasons for this, she whispered significantly. The doctor now straightened in his seat. It is a great pleasure to meet you all. I'm sure we're anxious to learn exactly why Sir Arthur wanted this gathering, but I suppose first we should eat? The doctor seemed to be doing unusually well at observing the social niceties. Perhaps certain recent conversations had put him more on his toes. Whatever the reasons behind them, his words were met with approval, and so the meal began. The last of the plates were cleaned away, and the guests were left with full stomachs and where requested digestifs. Nathan was puffing away once again at a cigarette, so far without further mishap. A frown had returned to dominate Sir Arthur's features. With a sigh, he clearly reached a reluctant decision. I know you're all curious as to my ulterior motive in bringing you here today. Strange things are afoot, both here and abroad. I fear I'm going to ask much from you in terms of aid. Once you have heard all I have to say, I hope you will still feel able to oblige he said seriously, looking at each of his guests in turn. The doctor grinned broadly and, he hoped, reassuringly. Well, I'm sure we will be able to speak more confidently once we know what it is you're asking. Sir Arthur inclined his head once, curtly. Then grabbing his crutches, he struggled to his feet and hobbled over to a small side desk under the window. He unlocked a drawer, opened it, and withdrew an object whose length was about twice the width of his hand. As he turned, he held it up for all to see, revealing it to be a stylized flat model of a scarab beetle, or similar Upsilon Orionis equivalent, its wings outstretched. It seemed to be made of a pale green translucent material, while much of its surface appeared to be covered in scratches or possibly engravings. With some difficulty, since he was further encumbered, Sir Arthur hobbled back to the table and placed the scarab upon it for better viewing. Feel free to pick it up and examine it while I explain its significance their host invited. I think this object, this scarab beetle of two faces, is in some way responsible for all my recent ills, and more besides. As Sir Arthur had said this, Timmy Cowley had been reaching for the scarab but froze upon hearing these words. The psychically more curious Penny Cowley picked it up instead, while Sir Arthur lowered himself back into his chair, placing the crutches behind him. I sense a great disturbance, Penny said in a deep and portentous voice. Sir Arthur looked at her curiously, then continued his tale. I discovered it during my first dig in search of the Anubis tomb about a year ago. He did not get very far before Romana raised a hand with a question. I'm sorry, the Anubis tomb? Sir Arthur cocked his head at her. I must say that as the Xeno-archaeologists I assume you both are, it is a surprise you somehow missed out on one of the ancient wonders of the solar system. Ah well, no matter. As he said this, he reached back and plucked a leather folder from the mantelpiece. He flipped it open to reveal many pockets of a cellophane-like material containing clippings, pages of notes, and what appeared to be photographs or similar realistic images of artifacts. He pulled one of the pictures free and passed it to Romana. She simultaneously frowned and widened her eyes as she studied the picture, while the doctor leant towards her slightly to get a better view. The image was in color, a little grainy or pixelated, but clearly showed a vast statue well over fifty meters tall, to judge from the tiny specks of Albions or Cairoans who had wandered into shot. It was the figure of a man, but not standing as one might expect. He was kneeling or lying on the desert, his shins and forearms flat against the sand, his buttocks resting upon his lower calves. The man appeared to have been sculpted entirely naked. Whatever the underlying stonework was made of, it had been completely faced in the purest white marble 
although its vast age had caused some of these covering plates to fall. The body of the figure was completely parallel with the desert floor until it reached the shoulders and neck. The upper arms were at 90 degrees to the forearms and rose straight up to meet those same shoulders. The neck also supported the head straight up, staring enigmatically outwards, seeming to search the horizon. But most startling of all, it was not the head of an Albion. From the neck up, the stone shifted from white to a dark brown, still smooth enough to reflect some light but no longer marble, more some odd dun shade of obsidian. Long ears pointed skywards from the side of the head, almost as tall as the neck and cranium which supported them. A long snout also pointed out across the desert, under those searching eyes. It was the neck and head of a stylized dog. The look of horror still clung to Romana's face, and she leaned closer to the doctor, all enmity forgotten for a moment, as the vision dominated all thoughts. It looks like, Romana began, but was interrupted by the doctor. Shh, 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 he hissed, patting the air in front of him. I know what it looks like. Let's not be rude to our hosts. Romana narrowed her eyes at the doctor, all displeasure instantly restored. Nevertheless, she complied and made no further comment for the time being. So, as most of you know, I was leading an expedition to discover the fabled tomb, Sir Arthur continued, which supposedly lay undiscovered beneath the Anubis monument on Cairo. We had just uncovered what looked like a promising entrance chamber, which we hoped would lead us into the tomb complex itself. It was in the initial clearing of rubble from that chamber I unearthed this striking find. Here he gestured to the jade scarab, which had by now found its way into Romana's hands. The scarab is generally believed to be a symbol of good fortune. I certainly took it to be so at the time. Later events caused me to reconsider. Nevertheless, it is certainly unique amongst all scarabs I know of, in that it has two distinct faces, one of onyx, the other in jade. Surely, you might think, the most fortuitous of finds. Romana flipped it over in her hands, and sure enough, the reverse was black. Both faces, particularly the wings, were covered in arcane pictogram writing. The writing was obscure, even to Time Lord eyes, not simply by its form and structure, but also the time-worn nature of their scratched designs. The doctor extended his hand in a silent request to examine it further. Romana obliged, and the doctor withdrew his sonic screwdriver and scanned the artifact thoroughly on both faces. He frowned and grunted to himself, then passed the scarab back to Romana, who in turn allowed it to be passed back up the table to Sir Arthur. He in his turn pushed it towards Timmy, saying, Could you return it to my desk? There's a good fellow. Timmy was clearly uncomfortable handling this object, which was rapidly gathering a tainted reputation, if only up to now darkly hinted at. He covered his unease well, though, his sense of duty to his friend overriding his distaste, walked over to the desk under the window and placed it there before returning. You notice the inscriptions on it, no doubt, but they are a trifle difficult to read. So I made rubbings, Sir Arthur continued, and withdrew a couple of sheets of paper from his folder, passing them out. The very next day after discovering it, I received a telecom from Albia telling me of the sudden death of my father. Naturally, I had to return home and left the others to continue the dig. I brought the scarab with me, of course. Now I wonder if I brought all my troubles with it. He shook his head, lost in thought, then resumed his tale. After settling all the necessary family affairs, I returned to Londra and the museum, stopping first at home. There I discovered a telex informing me I had been promoted to curator in charge of expeditions. A turn of good fortune, you might think. I left immediately for the museum and was struck by a large black car as I crossed the street to my own vehicle. The curse of the scarab strikes again, the young man observed with a rueful smile. This explains the crutches, I suppose, Romana pointed out. Sir Arthur nodded. That was a month ago. For reasons no one seems able to pinpoint, my broken leg is taking far longer than expected to heal. However, I fear I got off lightly given the recent tragic news. Have you seen the latest papers? The final question was directed to the doctor and Romana. Both shook their heads, frowning. Buchan reached down and picked up a rolled newspaper, tied with a loop of string. He then tossed it most of the length of the table, whereupon the doctor, with the nodded consent of Romana, picked it up. It's on the front page, 
Sir Arthur supplied helpfully as the doctor unraveled the document. The doctor's frown deepened as he started to read. Romana's expression also darkened as she read over his right arm. Perhaps you could read it for the benefit of all, the leather-clad Lou now requested in a somewhat peeved tone. We haven't all had the luxury of free time away from our important and respected work to fritter away on the rags. Sir Arthur looked by turns annoyed, then embarrassed upon her behalf, but the doctor was oblivious to any awkwardness or tensions in the room. Naturally, he responded simply. The headline, Five Go Mad on Cairo, he said questioningly. Sir Arthur nodded grimly and so the doctor read on. Tragedy has struck the expedition from the Albion Imperial Museum, sent to uncover the fabled tomb of Anubis. On the evening of the 2nd of October, an army patrol came upon the base camp of the expedition and found it in a state of total anarchy and horror. All the native guides and bearers seemed to have long since fled. The only person still present, at least in body, were the museum scholars and logistics personnel themselves, a team of five individuals. Here the doctor paused for breath and to gauge the reaction of his audience. An eerie hush had fallen over the entire party. He clearly held their rapt attention. Two members of the expedition, he continued, had killed themselves in a most arbitrary and bloody manner, whilst those left alive were scarcely Albion in their behavior and had to be confined. It says, continued on page two. With these final words, the doctor looked up at Sir Arthur, who waved his hands and shook his head, silently indicating no continuation was necessary or desired. Using the table for support, he rose unsteadily to his feet and stared round intensely at everyone before him. Those are my dear friends and colleagues. As he said this, he looked pointedly at Professor Lou Halbert. She shifted uncomfortably, frowning, and for the first time looked as though she might not be entirely sure of herself. It was possible there was even a tinge of embarrassment to her demeanor, but it was hard to tell. That is my dig, my responsibility, and yet I cannot go. As he said this, he nodded down towards his leg, much as I would wish to. The damn doctors say I'll not be fit to travel for at least another fortnight. That is why I invited you all here. I'm sorry if I appear rude. You are, of course, here as my friends, but I need to put together a new expedition. You are not only the finest men and women I have the honor of knowing, but also the most gifted in your respective fields. The doctor mulled this over for a moment. So you wish to pack us all off to Cairo, eh? Yes. Yes, this could work out very well indeed. At that moment, a gasp came from Romana. Doctor, look! As she said this, she sprang to her feet, pointing towards the window. The net curtains were wafting gently in the warm evening breeze but under them extended an arm, wearing clothing which looked like rags of the poorest street urchin, ending in a hand which seized the scarab amulet. Romana darted towards it as it withdrew, the doctor on his feet and following mere nanoseconds behind. She thrust her head and body through the window, the doctor squeezing in beside her a moment later. Beneath the window was a sizable trench offering light to the sunken windows of the basement rooms. The thief must have been clinging to the wall with some difficulty in order to poke his arm into the room and steal the artifact. He had then clearly jumped from the wall to the museum courtyard beyond. Perhaps he had been injured through his efforts since, from what the doctor could make out, he seemed to be stumbling or shambling in the direction of the main building entrance. All was unfortunately unclear since night had well and truly fallen and what pools of illumination there were came from sparsely placed lampposts. The doctor turned to Romana. You got here first? Did you get a good look at them? What did they look like? By now, all but the injured Sir Arthur Buchan were also crowded close about the Time Lords in the window, one or two trying to cram themselves in as well. Romana looked confused and reticent as she spoke. I don't really feel comfortable saying, she declared cautiously casting glances at those around her. Come now, Romana, the doctor snapped hurriedly. Now is not the time to worry about our host's feelings. Romana frowned hard at the doctor. I was not worried about offending our Albion friends, she informed him icily. The doctor looked off balance again, having been caught wrong-footed. Nevertheless, he circled his left hand, encouraging her to elaborate. It's just, well, it looked like a mummy. 
Her statement was delivered with the desperate air of one who knows just how ridiculous it sounds. Towards the back of the throng, Nathan began to laugh, then stopped as he realized no one was joining in. The doctor leaned a little closer to Romana. If I'm not mistaken, that scarab may well be the key to all our troubles, ours and the universe. Whether it is the cause or the cure, I am not yet sure, he quietly confided. Then he turned to look over his shoulder, addressing the entire group. We have to get after it and recover it. By his tone, he would clearly brook no argument. In an instant, everyone was heading towards the door. Germain, who had been waiting patiently in the corridor beyond, was almost bowled off his feet as everyone rushed past him and out of the front door. Their course seemed obvious to the doctor, who took the lead in the running party, Romana at his side. They dashed the short distance to the southwestern corner of the courtyard. From there they turned northeast towards the stone steps of the museum main entrance. By now, their quarry was out of sight, but this had been the direction they had last seen him heading. As they ran, Romana murmured breathily to the doctor, I thought it would be earlier than October. Feels like a summer night to me. The doctor held up a familiar finger. Ah, yes, but Albia has sixteen months in its year. It's earlier than you think, he said, clearly pleased to be showing off his knowledge. Romana did not show the same pleasure in receiving it. As the doctor and his companions reached the base of those stone steps, they skidded abruptly to a halt, arrested by the sight before them. Lying sprawled across the stairs was the security guard Romana and the doctor had met upon their arrival. His eyes stared sightlessly up into the starry night. His neck had quite clearly been broken. This thief is obviously quite ruthless and quite strong, Lou noted coolly. No one felt like contradicting her. We need to plow on, the doctor said gravely, and with that began to mount the stairs. Romana, well used to his ways, no matter how annoying, was in lockstep with him. The rest followed after a moment's pause, casting the odd, wary glances back at the spread eagled body. At last, they stood in the grand entrance hall. To their left and right, wide stone staircases led up to the higher floors, while other corridors to the sides of these flights gave access to the rooms and galleries on this level. Even here, in this first chamber, there were a couple of statues from some unknown point in Albion history and who knows where within the Upsilon Orionis system. Directly ahead of them was what had once been an open-air inner courtyard. At some point, it had been entirely covered with a glass ceiling supported by a delicate framework of white painted metal. It was entirely possible that this new addition had been necessitated by what lay beneath. Filling the center of the canopied space was what looked like a vast wooden barrel. It was roughly the dimensions of two double-decker buses parked side by side, but looked far more ancient. Even though the wood of the body was undamaged and looked remarkably free from rot or decay, there was something very aged and desiccated about it. And the design itself, what could be seen of it from this distance at any rate, looked very primitive in terms of how it was lashed or bonded together. The doctor could see Romana staring at it, and knew she must be brimming over with questions. For her part, she clearly stifled that line of thought and forced her mind to more immediate matters. So, where do we go now? Or more importantly, where did they go? The doctor stroked his chin thoughtfully. A good question. It's strange they didn't make for the front gate and a quick getaway. That poor guard obviously left his post and tried to intercept our thief as they ran towards the main building. With, unfortunately, fatal consequences. The doctor pondered a little further. I don't suppose there's a back door to this place. As a matter of fact, there is a rear secondary entrance on the other side of the main courtyard, Timmy Cowley piped up helpfully. The doctor and Romana exchanged glances, shrugging to one another non-committally. Their silent communication was interrupted by a cough. Look, I'm sorry I laughed earlier, Nathan Ivon chipped in apologetically. It just seemed crazy, all this talk of mummies. But if it's a mummy we're after... Maybe we should check out the ancient Chiron funerary exhibit. Romana looked at the doctor and shrugged once more, saying, Perhaps not the most insane thing I've heard today. Now it was Timmy's turn to scoff. Utterly ludicrous, he proclaimed haughtily. The doctor shot him a less than sympathetic glance. Perhaps you and Penny might like to check out the rear entrance, 
since you apparently know the way already. Meanwhile, I suggest the rest of us carefully investigate the funerary exhibit. Professor Halbert, as you work here, I assume you know where it is? Lou Halbert nodded once in a businesslike manner. Lou, she corrected. Of course I do. It's on the second floor. We can take the main stairs here. Follow me. With that, Lou, the doctor, Romana and Nathan traipsed up the stairs, while Timmy and Penny Cowley started off across the inner courtyard. As they climbed, Romana leaned in discreetly towards the doctor. About the Anubis monument, Romana began. Yes, the doctor murmured back cautiously. It looks like a man doing naked yoga in a dog mask, Romana concluded. The doctor rolled his eyes. I said I know what it looks like, he responded wearily. Romana was not about to let it go. Bizarre appearance aside, it does bear an uncanny similarity to the Sphinx in Egypt on Earth. I even saw a couple of pyramids close by in the background. The doctor shook his head dismissively. Purely superficial, it is not the same. And pyramids are the simplest monumental architecture to achieve, which is why it crops up so many times through convergent evolution. Those in Egypt and Mesoamerica are unconnected in time and space, even method of construction and usage, and yet are linked by the necessity of impressive height. We have also recently seen similar constructions on Janus and Nielnia, utterly unconnected. The staircase split at the landing of the first floor, forming two parallel flights leading upwards, with an increasingly giddy view down upon the single broad flight they had just ascended. Romana shook her head at the doctor. Something just doesn't sit right. The name, Anubis. I'm sure the Egyptians had a god of almost exactly that name. And when were these monuments erected? Was it before or after they discovered the probe from Earth? Lou looked back over her shoulder. The Anubis monument was constructed, we think, sometime between five and eight thousand years ago. The pyramids more like three to four thousand. The discovery of the encyclopedia sometime towards the end of that period around the 3,000 mark. Ancient Cairo and civilization was already in full swing by that time. Clearly the Time Lords had not been as discreet as they had hoped. So how can the ancient Cairoans with no contact with Earth or its history have so much in common with it? Romana hissed at the doctor. Oh, I don't know, he hissed back. Some sort of accident with a meme and a time machine, perhaps? Together, all four explorers of the upper museum took the left of the twin staircases and arrived safe and sound at the second floor. The lighting was somewhat subdued at this time, no doubt to save power and money. Only those working unusually late, or perhaps an unfortunate security guard, would be there now. Lou led them through an archway into the dim room beyond. Even in this muted illumination, it was clear they had entered their desired destination. Glass cases covered every wall, while still more were freestanding and crowded the floor. Each was packed with wood or stone. Plaques or fragments covered in the colorful pictograms of ancient Cairoan civilization. Many of these were fragments of sarcophagi or tomb masonry. Still more cases contained statuary of various gods or deceased important persons. But it was the multitude of sarcophagi themselves, many of them open which most firmly assured the companions that they had indeed arrived. Many of these open caskets were stood upright and contained cloth-wrapped corpses for all to examine and admire, behind glass, of course. See anyone you know? The doctor asked Romana, attempting to make some light of the situation. Romana raised an eyebrow at him. Unfortunately, only outside the coffins, she said ominously. The doctor grimaced, then turned and started to creep further into the room. Romana, look, the doctor cried, stopping suddenly and pointing. Ahead of them, in the center of the room, one of the display cases stood smashed open. The sarcophagus it contained remained upright and standing open, but its lid lay on the floor outside the case, among the shards of glass. In addition to this foul play, it also seemed there was something wrong with the inner surface of the coffin, the one which would have formed its floor when in use. However, from where the party now stood, just what was wrong was unclear. This is a job for a professional investigator, Nathan proclaimed confidently, and strode towards the damaged display. It was as he approached the case itself that a silent watcher was revealed. From between two adjacent display cases dashed, or perhaps more staggered, a bedraggled figure. In the confusion of its motion, 
It was as yet unclear who or what they were dealing with, but if a street urchin it must be nearly adult and of the most impoverished type, given its state of dress. The rushing figure had its arms outstretched, hands extending straight for the neck of Nathan Ivan. It was at that moment that Nathan, looking away from his approaching assailant and oblivious to the danger, took the opportunity to bend over and pick up a fragment of glass. The figure collided with him, flying over Nathan's bent back and landing in a heap beyond him on the floor. Nathan was also squashed flat on his face by the collision, but of the two it was the attacker who rose first. And there could be no doubt now as to his identity. This rag-bound figure stared at the gathered Albions and Time Lords with desiccated, shriveled eyes. It swung its tattered arms threateningly in front of them. Nathan rolled onto one side, looking up at the back of their enemy. He reached into his trench coat and withdrew a pistol, which looked very similar to a Luger P08, and pointed it up towards the monster's back. He fired, and the Time Lords were surprised the shot was more a futt than a bang, and there was no smoke or smell of cordite. The hole which appeared in the front of the mummy was also very small and neat. The projectile which exited swiftly, and fortunately hit no one else, seemed more needle-like than typical earthly ordnance. Small hole aside, the mummy seemed unaffected by the shot. However, perhaps sensing it was outnumbered, it gave a chilling, wordless, moaning roar. Then it turned on its heels, ran straight into the sarcophagus, and vanished. For a moment no one moved, stunned into paralysis. Then the doctor and Romana dashed forward to help Nathan to his feet, but also to stare into the mysterious base of the ancient Chiron coffin. Nathan dusted himself off as he was helped up. What the devil just happened? He asked grumpily. Our thief just ran in there, the doctor explained, pointing into the sarcophagus. At this distance, the unusual nature of its base could be clearly seen. In place of wood, it looked like nothing so much as boiling, oily black smoke, completely unnatural. Lou had moved to stand with the other three. Nathan stared at the glass fragment, still in his hand. Then he tossed it into the sarcophagus. The shard vanished, the smoke disturbed slightly by its passage but without sound or any other sign as to its whereabouts. It didn't even touch bottom, Nathan mused to himself. Lou stuck her hands on her hips. Well, obviously that's where our thief has gone. We need to get after him. With that, she dashed towards the writhing, smoky surface. No, the doctor cried, rushing after her, trying to prevent her entering the strange portal, if that was what it was. He managed to grab her shoulders just as her right arm entered the smoke. Lou Halbert screamed as if her very soul were being torn from her, a sound to chill the hearts of all. The doctor pulled her backwards and her arm returned from the inky blackness. Romana gasped as she saw the state of it. The leather of the arm of Lou's flapper coat looked dry, faded and cracked, as if neglected for many years. What could be seen of the skin of Lou's hand and forearm looked unhealthy had lost the usual shine shared by all Albions so far encountered, indeed looked wrinkled, and the arm shriveled. Lou fell back into the doctor's arms, deathly still.
Masters, mistresses, the doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal, or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the Doctor are also available on Amazon. Links are in the description below. Thank you, Masters, Mistresses.